that song just was wonderful, wasn't it? We could take that on the road, church. Good job. <laughs> Good job. No, it sounded great. And uh, we do have a lot to be praise, or, uh, thankful for, don't we? Um, just, uh, just a lot of blessings that give, God gives to us each and every day. Many times we don't even realize it. So we've all made it here, and we're in the house of the Lord. What, what a great place to uh, be if Jesus calls us home, right? Let's, we're, we're ready, right? So I hope you're here prepared to, uh, to receive a blessing. I hope you prepared your heart to receive communion. And like I said, um, as believers in Jesus Christ, this is important, an important part that we partake in. So uh, just remember that. Just be reflecting upon your your lives and, and uh, surrendering, surrendering over parts of your lives that you haven't uh, done so um, on behalf uh, of your life. So surrender that over to Christ at this moment. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we come to you today and thank you again for this day that you've given to us that we can glorify your name, that we can serve you, that we can be in your house. Father, we ask that you would uh, put a hedge of protection around this service today as we know that the evil one is knocking at the door and wanting in and to, to distract and destroy what's going to be going on and, and influencing our hearts to not receive your message but father we we pray we pray that you would prepare our hearts for the message at hand we ask that you put a special hedge of protection around pastor as he comes with your word and and prays your or uh says your truth lord preaches your truth that we would be uh, receptive to that and apply it to our lives father we also ask that you'd be with our nation as um with the turmoil that's going in we we need to stand strong with israel lord we ask that you would be with them and uh, be with those nations that are uh, coming alongside israel and uh, father just uh, let this glorify you and all we all we uh, say and do father we again thank you for this day that you've given to us to live for you you've given us the breath to live this day for you and if there's one that doesn't know you as lord and savior we pray today that they would come to to know you um today is the day of salvation you say so we just we pray for that at this time and father we also think of our missionaries around the world we ask that you'd be with them as they're pro proclaiming the good news of jesus christ to those people that are lost also be with us as we go through this week and and we do the same we have our own little mission field right here in northwest ohio where you've put us and help us to reach the lost in our in our um little area too of this world along with uh many other areas uh, that other people that you've put your your children there to to preach the word to lord father again thank you for this day that you've given to us and we ask these things in Jesus' name amen you may be seated a few announcements I'd like to bring forward at this time. Uh, November 5th will be Natalie Siebenauer Sunday, so there will be a offering, love offering back there for her. Just remember that. Uh, November 19th will be the Thanksgiving dinner along with the Operation Christmas, or, uh, Christmas Child. Uh, so bring your boxes that day, and they'll get delivered to where they need to be. So... Um, I don't know if there's any more boxes out there. If there is, there is some more boxes out there. So if you haven't grabbed one and you'd like to, they're out there and, and feel free to, to do so. Um, also, remember that the uh, December the 17th will be the Christmas cantata. Uh, there will be November, on the November the 1st, there will be Christmas choir practice at 8 o'clock. So remember that. That would be after the, the prayer meeting. Um, also, just a remembrance that the member, men's breakfast at 8 o'clock on November 4th, and that um, we fall back November 5th at one hour. So remember that also, and then that also will, there, there will be the youth activity, activity from 12 to 2 that day also. Also, there is a directory sign-up sheet in the back. Um, please 
check that over, make sure your information is right. If you would like to be added to that directory, fill that out, um, and uh, we'll update that directory as we, we'd like to keep that current so that everybody's got uh, an avenue to contact um, when, when we need to. So um, please, please visit that, make sure everything's right. And if you're not on there and you'd like to update that, uh, please do so also. So um, let's see, just, just a couple of reminders. Uh, there at the bo bottom, it says, if you are the last one out of the church, be sure all the doors are locked. We have great investment here that we need to watch out for. So um, there was, there's been a couple times where the door was unlocked, so we need to make sure that double, double check, triple check, whatever we got to do, make sure everything's closed up and locked up so um, we, we don't have any incidents that will happen. So um, is there any other announcements at this time? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. The business meeting meet, or business meeting after today's worship. So, uh, thank you, Betty, for uh, putting that out. So, yep. John. Uh, as most of you probably know, my I had my brother Ron passed away a week ago, Friday, and I want to thank everybody for the prayers and the cards. Pretty smart, appreciated. Any others? Steve? Well, as most of you know, October has came and almost went, but we didn't miss you, Pastor. October is Pastor Appreciation Month, and where's Betty at? She's like, there she is. Could you come up here with your hubby? With Pastor Hubby? One of the same. Yeah, one of the same this morning. Well, it's my privilege to, to be able to represent the elders and even more so the church body to express our appreciation and affirmation of our pastor and wife, Betty. And, and 15 years? Is, are we out of 15 now? <laughs> but, we, but we really do appreciate everything that they do for our church. And, and maybe this morning, maybe this morning, and you could be... Stand up and, and say, why do you come to this church? What do you appreciate about pastor? Don't be bashful. I know Charles will be the first one to stand up. What do you appreciate about pastor? <laughs> He's willing to find the Lord and try to get the will of the Lord and everything and the services and people to come and everything else. But Brother Mike and I were here three years ago or so. We prayed that the Lord would send us a certain number in. He went over and above that number. Different times. Amen. God does answer prayer. John? Well, I know one thing. He, he's a cousin of mine, so I've known him for a long time. But I appreciate the fact that he always preaches from the Word. I've never heard a sermon from him that wasn't right. Go ahead. Go ahead.
the twin cents. And uh, when the church that we were going to in Eden folded, we didn't know, you know, where we were going to go. And uh, I think it was probably Jessica and Chris, you know, kind of said, oh, you'll, you'll love it, Mom, you'll love it. And so we started coming here, and there's been no regrets. Like for a hometown boy, he does a really good job. And like they said, he does preach the word, and that's amazing. Amen. We don't want to leave anybody out. I appreciate that he is, I feel, a Bible scholar. And he's teaching us everything he knows, and we're working on it. But... <laughs> Well, he always preaches to the flock. So today, I want the flock to say, we love you, Pastor. One, two, three. We love you, Pastor. <laughs> so we'd like to present a little gift to you. Thank you very much. We are very blessed. I just, uh, I can't say enough. I, I'm like with all you guys too, that I'm just thankful that he comes and preaches the word of God because this is truth. I mean, there's there's a lot of faults out there, but this is truth. And and, and that's where the word of God starts. So um, thank you. Appreciate it. All the service that you, and time and effort that you put into to us and uh, everything. So. Is there any birthdays at this time? seated and at this time Kendall and Hope Siebenauer have a special
shadow you light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me Thank you so much for that. Appreciate that. At this time, Junior Church is dismissed. Good job, girls. That was fantastic. Amen? They did an awesome job. They're just getting better and better and better. I think we're going to keep them around for a long time. Amen? All right. Well, it's good to be back with you. Betty and I had a good time away. We had a good time last night, did we not, at the chili cookout? Did you all get filled up? If you didn't, you missed a real blessing. There, there was that one pot of chili. That was all good. But I got into that one pot of chili that was seasoned hot. Where's the, where's the cooks, the chefs at? I'm not seeing them. Where are they at? Tony and Judy? There's Tony right in front of me. I don't know where Judy is. But, uh, boy, that was some pretty good. That just perks you right up. Ooh, oh, 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 oh. Good stuff. But we had a great time, good fellowship. If you missed it, you missed a good time. Well, we're here today to worship the Lord and to praise the Lord, and we're going to observe the Lord's table in just a minute. And uh, let's look to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing upon this part of the service. Father, we look to You. We need Your strength. We need Your guidance. We need the power of Your Spirit to help us to receive the Word into our heart and life, to break down the barriers, the walls that Perhaps we have erected in our heart and life toward you, toward your word. We pray that word will speak to our heart today in a mighty way. Make us sensitive to your great love for us and the great sacrifice that you offered to the cross of Calvary for our sin. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bible and look with me in Matthew chapter 26. Uh, we use this passage of Scripture when we take the Lord's table. And I just thought I would begin there this morning as a place of a starting point. And by the way, I want to say thank you to Drew, who did a great job of preaching. In my absence, I, I've heard the one message, and it's just a fantastic message. I haven't had a chance to listen to the second message, but I appreciate his faithfulness, and I know you do as well. In verse 26, it says this of Matthew chapter 26. It says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, gave it thanks, and gave it to them, and saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And then he says, verse 29, But I say unto you, I will not, hence, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. We look forward to that day when one day the Lord Jesus Christ in you and I are united together with him, and we partake again of this table, remembering 
what he came to do in the cross of Calvary for your sin and my sin. But in the meantime, he gave us this ordinance as a church where we come together and we observe these articles of the ordinance, the bread and the cup, which speaks to his body, which speaks to the shed blood that he shed in our behalf. And as we observe this as a church, we're reminded that one day he's coming back for the redemption of the purchased possession. If you're a born-again believer, you are his purchased possession. And one day he's coming back for you, and that could happen at any time. When you look at what's happening in the nation of Israel, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we were speaking on prophecy. We're going to come back to that next Sunday. But one of the points we made in the uh, message three weeks ago was that this man of sin will come on the scene in a period of time when the world is in flux, and the world is in great turmoil. And what will he do? He will make a peace treaty with the nation of Israel, and the nations of the world will abide by that peace treaty, at least for a time they will, but at least Israel will be convinced that it will be a, a good treaty and they will come under that treaty. And I thought, as we look at the world today and see what's happening in the Middle East, what a perfect time. Boy, your spidey senses, so to speak, ought to be alert to that, that this could be the very hour the Lord Jesus Christ split the eastern sky, calls his church out, and that man of sin come on the scene and that treaty would be brokered. We are living in perilous, perilous time. But in the meantime, the Lord said to his church, you and I, if you know the Lord, you are his church. If you know him as your personal Savior, you're not his church because you're in the church. You're not his church because you might be even a member of this church. You are his church because you have been born again, washed in the blood, received what he came to this earth to do, to die on the cross for your sin. That places you into the body of Jesus Christ. And he is coming back for that church. And he's going to call that church out, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and other sorted passages of Scripture in other places with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the Bible says the dead in Christ are going to be called out. What a great day that will be. No more pain, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more tired bones, no more Mr. Arthritis. Anybody got a little hymn today? Maybe you do. You get up. You can tell the people who got arthritis, they get up slow. They just don't jump up and take off running. They get up very slow. And when they get up, they kind of, uh, they groan. <laughs> you know why that is? It's because they're getting old and feeble. They're getting Arthur in there and their back and their hips and their knee joints. Right, Shirley? She's have a little bit of arthritis and some of the rest of you do as well. One day that will all be gone and we'll have new and glorified bodies likened to his. But in the meantime, as a church, we come together and we take this table. We reflect upon what he came to do for us. We examine our hearts before we take this table. So vitally important. The scriptures admonish us to do that. Go with me back to the book of Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And in this great, great passage of scripture... It really speaks about what the Lord came to do for us. Uh, we're not going to have time to go through every verse this morning. I would love to spend time in every verse this morning. But I want us to look at a little bit here of Isaiah chapter 53 and dissect some of this this morning for our worship, for our preparation for the Lord's table. Isaiah is writing, as from what I've read and what I've studied, approximately 700 years before Christ came. And he's writing and he's foretelling of what Christ would come to do. One day he would come to be the Savior of the world. He would confront sin and Satan at the cross, and he would make them defeated foes. And we know one day that Satan will be defeated, will he not? He'll be thrown into the bottomless pit, and the Antichrist and the false prophet will be thrown into the lake of fire. And you and I will no more be tormented and tested by him. But Isaiah writes about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gives the report of his coming. Look with me, if you will, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. He's asked this question. He says, who hath believed our report? Question mark. The question is being asked. Who hath believed our report? Well, if you go back and you do a little bit of reference work of what Isaiah has said in this chapter, as a matter of fact, I was back in the office back there and pulled one of the commentaries off of the shelf and uh, there is a number of things that this one commentary share, shares that Isaiah shares about the report when he says who hath believed our report Isaiah prophetically foretold the Lord Jesus Christ to come and what he would do when he would come he said he would be born 
of a virgin. He would come to be God's servant. He would be a descendant of Jesse through the line of David. He would be empowered by the Spirit. He would be gentle toward the weak. And you know, the Jewish nation, they had this conception in their mind that when he would come, he would come with lights, camera, action, trumpets blaring, the King of kings, Lord of lords, and they were prepared to fall down before him. But when he came, he did not come that way. <laughs> he came in a very humble, humble beginning. As a matter of fact, he came to a, to a home of great poverty. He was gentle toward the weak. Not only that, he voluntarily submitted himself to suffering. Isaiah shares a number of things that I found in this commentary about what the Lord said he would come to do. But one of the things, he would come one day to rule the world, but not before he came to suffer and die for the, your sins and my sins at the cross. And so Isaiah asked this question, who hath believed our report? As far as the Jewish nation is concerned, by and large, they failed to believe the report of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, he writes to that very end. If you take your Bible and turn with me back to the book of Romans chapter 10, turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Notice what he says. This is many years after Isaiah's prophecy, after all that Isaiah foretold. The Apostle Paul writes about what he sees in the heart and life of the Jewish nation. And notice what he says in Isaiah chapter, or Romans chapter 10, verses 1 and 3. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Well, what was he talking about? Well, the Jewish nation this morning has a, certainly has a zeal for God. What is it that they covet most? They want access to the Temple Mount. Why do they want access to the Temple Mount? They want access to the Temple Mount that they might be able to reinstitute the Old Testament sacrifices which they have observed and practiced over all these hundreds and hundreds of years. Why do they want to do that? Because they do not believe the Jesus that came 2,000 years ago who came to be the Savior of the world. They reject him as the Savior of the world. They say he's an imposter. He's a blasphemer. For that reason, they crucified him. But we know that during the tribulation, their eyes are going to be mightily open, and they're going to look upon the one whom they have pierced. But Paul writes of, these, of the Jewish nation, he said, I bear them record, verse 2, that they have a zeal of God. Dear friend, this morning, you can have a zeal of God and not be saved. Did you know that? You can go to church. You can follow in the ordinances of the church. You can, be, you can be faithful working in the church. You can have a zeal for God, but never, ever humbled your heart and repented of your sin, and called out to him to be the savior of your soul. That is the only way that a man can be saved. You and I cannot lift ourselves up by our own bootstraps and work our way into heaven. We must be born again. We must come to the Lord Jesus Christ and receive him as our Lord and Savior. You say it sounds so simple. It is simple. But it involves the humbling of our heart. And that's a hard thing for a man to do, to admit that I have sinned, that I have fallen short, that I have missed the mark. Every one of us fall short. Every one of us missed the mark. Every one of us need a Savior. And every one of us, regardless of the zeal that we have for God, unless we humble ourselves and come to him and say, it's me, O Lord. It's not, it's not my neighbor. It's not my family member. It's me, O Lord, standing in the need of God. Like the old Negro spirit, so it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me. We have to see our brokenness. We have to see our sinfulness. We have to see that we have fallen short of the righteousness of Almighty God. And if the only thing that you can see is your goodness, I guarantee you, like Justin Wilson, that Cajun cook says, I guarantee you, you will fall short. You will miss heaven. You had a zeal. Hell will be filled with men and women who had a zeal for God but they would not humble themselves and repent of their sin and take possession of it and say, it's my sin that put Jesus Christ on the cross. It's my sin. It's your sin. It's the world's sin that he loved so much that he came and died on the cross because he was not willing that they would perish. And Paul said of his Jewish brethren, he says, verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness are going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of of Almighty God, you and I this morning need to submit ourselves to the righteousness of Almighty God. Why did Israel 
not believe the report of his coming. Isaiah chapter 53, go back with me if you will to Isaiah chapter 53 and let's just pick it up again in verse 1 and read on down to verse 2. It says, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Do you realize that this morning? That when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the arm of the Lord is extended to you. He says, come unto me, all you that are labor and heavy laden. When the Lord began to prick your heart and move your heart, the arm of the Lord is extended to you. He's beckoning you to come to him. Now, you can reject that arm of the Lord. You are a free moral agent. You can do that. You can reject his will. You can say, no, I, I don't want to receive what you have. I want to have more fun out there in the world, and, and then I'll come to you at a more convenient time. Was that not Agrippa that said that? When I have a more convenient season? You know, I want to live my life. I want to have my, friend, my fun with my friends and, and, ha and have these great parties and we're going to do these things and do it while I'm young. But when I get old and feeble and get Mr. Arthur in my back, then I'll humble myself. But did you realize the arm of the Lord may no longer be extended to you? The arm of the Lord is extended to you now. The Bible says, Drew said it this morning, today is the day of salvation. You don't know how long the arm of the Lord is going to be extended. He extends that arm to you because of his mercy and his love and his grace. But if you choose to say no to it, he says, okay, you can go your own way and live your own life and, and let the zeal of your own goodness try to merit eternal worth, but it won't happen. When the, God, when the God of heaven extends his arm toward you, you and I need to respond to it. When the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart, as to your sinfulness, as to your brokenness, you need to respond to it. Now watch what it says, verse 2. For he hath grown up before him as a tender plant, speaking of the Lord Jesus, as a root out of dry ground. The Lord Jesus Christ was like a root, a tender plant, taken out of dried ground. He's, care, he's compared to a root that was live and flourished and placed in a place that was dry ground. That's the Jewish nation. Jesus, what does the Bible say? John chapter 1, verse 11, he said, He came to his own, and his own, what? They received him not. Why? Because they are dry ground. What was Jesus? Jesus was a young and tender root. The nation of Israel failed to have spiritual receptivity. Now, missionaries sometimes go to places that are dry ground. And God has the ability in some of these places to move the heart and mind of men and women to respond to this root that is the Lord Jesus Christ and come to Christ and begin to flourish where the gospel is preached. But the Bible here says in chapter 3, verse 52, that the nation of Israel is speaking to the nation of Israel. He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground, and he shall have no form of comeliness. He had the commonality of a normal man. The Jewish nation did not expect that. They did not expect this Jesus who come and called himself Jesus, the son of Joseph from Mary. You and I know the rest of the story. He was the virgin born son of the living God. He was not the biological son of, the Lord, of Joseph. He was the biological son of the, Lord Jesus, of, of the God of heaven. The God of heaven caused the Lord Jesus Christ to come into the world, into the womb of Mary, through the conception in the womb of Mary. God caused this by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the Lord Jesus Christ come, the Bible says that when the nation of Israel looked upon him, remember that it says they were, they were like the dry ground that this root was being sown into. They rejected him. They failed to receive him. And it says here there was, he had no form of comeliness. There was, there was no look of divinity as far as they were concerned upon the Lord Jesus Christ. If you'll remember back in the book of Matthew, on the Mount of Transfiguration, when several disciples went with the Lord Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration, they beheld that look of divinity when he was on that mountain. His, 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 his presence just glowed. His garment was pure and white. The Apostle Peter spoke about that back in 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 16 of this divinity that was displayed just for a short time. And he wrote about this. And notice what he says in 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 16. He says, For we have not followed cunning devised fables 
when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says this, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. What was he talking about? He was talking about when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there with the Lord Jesus Christ. He walked up this mountain with this man called Jesus who came to be the Savior of the world, and he looked very common until that moment when the presence of Almighty God came upon him, that, that presence that he had with the Father. And dear friend, this morning, the, the nations of the world and men and women, even within churches today, still despise this Lord Jesus. Jesus is still being despised and rejected to men. How is Jesus being despised? We've been talking about that a little bit on Sunday night. And, uh, you know, you can, you can take the name of God and use it in a way of profanity. You can talk about the Lord Jesus and use it as a words of profanity. And the world will listen at that. They might laugh at that. They, 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 they will think nothing of it. But just as soon as you start to share your testimony of what Jesus Christ means to you, the world can't hardly stomach it. They don't want you to speak of what the Lord Jesus Christ means to you. And I want you to know this morning, the Lord Jesus is still being despised. His word is being despised. His testimony is being despised. And not only that, his day is being despised. How is it despised? Well, it's despised by the culture that we're living in. You heard of cancel culture? Why? They despise his word. And you've heard of woke? Why, what, what is all that about? It's about despising the Lord Jesus Christ. It's about despising his word, the authority of his word. And you've heard of BLM. That, what, what, what is behind all of that? They despise the word of Almighty God. They despise the word of Almighty God. Some of the biggest despisers are even men, men and women who make their way into the church. One of the things that beset the nation of Israel was idolatry. And idolatry is anything that comes between you and I and God, that we elevate to a place of importance ahead of God. You say, well, I would never do such a thing as that. But yet, Satan has a way of deceiving us into doing those very things. He has convinced us that this day belongs to us for our pleasure. That's what he's done. He is so clever, so clever. You know, we talk about idolatry uh, we are consumed with sport, are we not? We are consumed with sports. And sports are good. Sports can be fun. And they should be. But sports should never take the place of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most definitely on his day. Amen. On that time that is set apart that belongs to him. You know, there was a time that in the middle of the week, Wednesday was set aside for prayer meeting. And the school system knew that. They understood that. And there was no practices after a certain time, so the athletes who were going to church could go to church and be a part of Christ Seekers and their youth activities and their various churches. There was that time that was reverenced and set aside, but more and more that stuff is just being completely shoved aside. And now there's a new form of deception, I think, and I'll just throw it out to you and see what you think. Our kids are being told that, you know, you're really going to arrive if you're on a travel team. Well, you realize, there's a friend this morning, how do you get on that travel team? Shell out $100, $150, and Junior, who couldn't catch anything but a cold, can be on a travel team. <laughs> as if he's something. As if she's something. And parents, there's nothing wrong with travel team if you want to do that, but you know there's a time and place for that. And Sunday morning belongs to the Lord. Amen. And Sunday night belongs to the Lord. Yes. That is his day. Now, there's nothing wrong with sports. So if you're going to get mad at me, that's okay. I'm, I'm armed for bear this morning. That's okay. <laughs> but I want you to know there's a time and place for the things of the Lord. I believe the soul of my son and the soul of my daughter is more important than them making first team, making varsity, or any other. Amen. Whether it's the arts, whether it's sports, whatever it is, this day belongs to the Lord. Amen. But yet we despise him, do we not? 
why he says here, who hath believed our report? Verse 3, he says, he is despised and rejected of men. He is despised and rejected of men. If any sport, any activity, school activity, takes the precedent over this day of belonging to the Lord, we have despised him when he came to do for us. It has become our idol. Our idol. You know, we can talk about the Lord, we can recite all the facts about his word, but if there's a gap in the profession of the faith that we have and the life that we are living, what we are living is a lie. Is a lie. And so the Bible asks a question. What can a man give in exchange for his soul? Hmm. Well, you know I made first team. You know I made first chair. You know I made varsity. Well, I was on the travel team, and I couldn't be in church on Sunday morning because I had a game Sunday morning of all times, 9.30 in the morning. Well, there's nothing wrong with your travel team, but just tell them you won't be there. You go to church and you worship the Lord. Well, you know, I might not get to play. Well, let me tell you something. If you will honor God, God will honor you. God will honor you. But you better learn to honor God first. Learn to honor God. If you'll honor him, He'll honor you. He'll do it every time. It won't always be easy. Joseph stood up in a tough situation when his master's wife threw herself at him in a very seductive manner. But Joseph chose at that very moment to honor God. And that's what God's looking from us this morning. The son of my daughter and my son is far more important, the soul of my son or daughter is far more important than any earthly achievement that they could possibly get in this life. And I have to do my best to have them in a place where they can hear the word. As fathers, as fathers, the head of our homes, the shepherd of our flock that we have within our home, it is our spiritual responsibility to watch out and to care for our home. Amen? Amen. Why did he come? Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, he came. Surely he hath carried our grief. He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. We have a picture here of a suffering Savior who went to the cross because he was not willing that any should perish. Your son, your daughter will one day perish if they don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He went to the cross. Notice it says here, in chapter 3, verse four, 53, verse 4, he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. It's dealing with the emotional pain, the griefs, the sorrows, the struggles, the depressions, the announcement that we have cancer, the, the, the dealing with the issues of physical uh, deterioration of our bodies as we grow older and that pain and that emotional mental strain that weighs upon our life. As we grow older and dealing with those things, he came when he went to the cross. He felt your pain. He felt your suffering. He bore that. The family troubles, the mental issues, the emotional issues, he faced all of that at the cross in your behalf and my behalf so that when we could come to him and throw our burdens upon him and he would know exactly what you're feeling because he experienced it when he went to the cross. He suffered physically. He was wounded for my transgressions. That's my willful rebellion. It's the sin we deliberately do knowing we shouldn't do it. That is transgressions. And then the Bible says he was crushed. He was bruised for our iniquities. That describes the corruptible nature. It's sin's power to twist and distort our reasoning. I'm not going to do this no more. I've given myself to you, Lord. And it isn't long. The enemy comes in. He worms his way in and we find a way to compromise our stand. That's our iniquity. That's the carnal flesh at work. At the cross, he experienced what I should have experienced. Look what it says, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. The Lord Jesus Christ, dear friend, this morning came to die on the cross for your sins and mine. The Bible reminds us in this great passage of Scripture, if you read on down through here, it says, by his stripes we are healed. If you read on down through this chapter, 
What is it talking about? Is it talking about our physical healing? I don't believe that it is. Now, there's some denominations out there that will claim that. I believe that we can be healed if the Lord chooses to heal us. And most definitely for that to happen, we need to come to Christ and know him as our Savior. But as is written in the context of this chapter, he was talking about our spiritual restoration and healing. When we come to him and are born again, we are healed in the eyes of Almighty God. One day we will experience our glorification and all the things of this flesh will be laid aside and we will no more have to deal with the infirmities of, of the flesh. Man will made, be made completely whole, be made completely whole. So when I come to Christ and receive what he did for me, what can I have this morning? I can have peace with God. Amen. I can have peace with God. Do you have that peace of God this morning? Do you have that peace of God because you've trusted him as your Lord and Savior? Well, you can have it this morning. You can have it. You can simply bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I have fallen short. I have missed the mark. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And you can name that sin. And you might be naming that sin for a long period of time. But there will be sin that you don't even know that is sin. And God, in his mercy and his grace, when you humble yourself and cry out to him and say, I'm a sinner, please, Lord Jesus, forgive me. And I receive what you did at the cross for my justification that I could be saved. If you would mean that and pray that from the very depths of your heart, let me tell you something. The Lord Jesus Christ will come into your heart and life, and he will become the Lord and Savior of your soul. And you will experience, by his stripes, the spiritual healing of your brokenness, your sinfulness, your diseased flesh, the disease of sin, you will experience that healing. Father in heaven, this morning we thank you for the word. We thank you for what you teach us so powerfully in your word this morning. Father, should there be one in our midst this morning that does not know you as their Lord and Savior, I pray, Father, you'll give them unrest. Because today the spirit of the living God is pricking at their heart. Today they're uneasy about their soul. They're uneasy about the thought of death and eternity. And what is happening, the arm of the Lord is extended to them this morning. I pray, Father, they will not shun the arm of the Almighty God. I pray that they will cry out in childlike faith and invite you to come into their heart and life. And then profess you before men as you've commanded us to do. Have your will and way as we sing this song of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your